Jake Ludington here at HP Discover, and I'm here with Rafa Loss, and we're going to talk about security. The last time I caught up with you, I think that was in Vegas. It was. Um, we talked a little bit about the concept of resilience yes. in, in the confines of security. Yes. Are, are you still uh, looking at that as being a, a prime thing that security should be focused on? Yeah, it, it, indeed. Uh, it's one of those things that's going to carry, I think, next couple of years. As security evolves, we start to learn and think about security in sort of non-conventional terms. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, you've got the typical antivirus, you know, IPS, firewall, you know, manager patches kind of stuff. but Enterprise resilience speaks more to how does that all holistically work together? Where are all the bits that we don't talk about as security professionals? So it, it's still on it. So, so what key things are you seeing right now? Um, I mean, in terms of, of applying resilience to the security infrastructure. Yeah, so uh, I, I've got this analogy I've been using. It's actually worked out quite well. Uh, many of you out there uh, have safes in your home, right? Because if heaven forbid the house should catch fire, you want your valuables to be able to not go up in flames, so to speak. So it, this is sort of like enterprise security. And, and it's actually closer to enterprise security than we'd like to admit, because we're not going to prevent, I mean, you can't prevent the fire. You can do everything you can to keep the house from catching on fire. But at some point, you're out of the house, you have a, you know, some electrical appliance goes spark and all of a sudden, poof, right? The problem is uh, it's not preventing. It's detecting, responding, and restoring quickly. Uh, and part of that is this whole notion of safes. And we all have safes, and most of us have safes. And it's not, the safe isn't fireproof, right? You can't just drop it into a fire for 10 hours and go, yep, it's going to be like that forever. It's a certain temp outside temperature with a certain core temperature for a certain period of time. This is what enterprise security is turning into these days. And it is how long can you keep the attackers at bay, essentially beating on your infrastructure, before you figure out they're there, and then you're able to respond somehow and restore service and get back to business, right? So in this, it's sort of like I give this talk to the execs out there. And they sort of stare at you, stare at you, stare at you. And all of a sudden, like this, you can see the light bulb going on. They're like, you know, that's true. So what I'm paying, what I'm really paying for in my security budget is an increase in that burn time. How how, how much time can I can I buy myself, right? How much time can we buy ourselves as the enterprise? Uh, because it's, it's, that's what really we want. We're not going to magically spend enough money to where the hackers don't come get us. They will come get you. It's can you find them? Can you get you know restore, stop what they're doing and get yourself back to business in a reasonable amount of time? So you're really trying to slow people down, is what you're saying. But how do you go about slowing people down? What are the what are the effective ways of slowing people down? Yeah. So there's the traditional security bolt-ons, the things that we sort of add on after the fact. Um, you've got your anti-malware. You've got your network firewalls. You've got your intrusion prevention. You've got all those kinds of things. But then there's the non-traditional things that we do as a company that I think nobody else does. Uh, but that the industry really is starting to look at too is things like asset management, things like change management, right? Foundational to security is knowing what's on that network, whether it should be there, whether it's trusted, what it did last time it was there, who's operating it. Um, and it's funny because, you know, we did this 15 years ago, but we didn't really call it this. Like, you know, a lot of security professionals or CISOs or their delegates are not on change review boards. But yet, we complain when something pops up on the network that we don't know about. It's like, okay, you can't, you don't get to complain about it if you're not there to say no. And it's not really, it's not even about saying no sometimes. It's about saying, hey, look, um, what you're about to do is circumvent security processes we have. Can you at least give us a chance to do compensating controls on this? And sometimes the answer is yes, you can. Sometimes it's too late. We're going to deploy tomorrow, figure it out. But at least you can figure it out, right? So change is, change and as fast as the enterprise world changes today, I mean, look, you know, you wake up, you wake up and walk into work one day, and all of a sudden, you've you, your company's gone to the cloud. You've now next day, you're like, hey, uh, why does everybody have their own tablets? Oh, we've decided BYOD was a great idea, right? You can't effectively manage security with those draconian ways we used to, where it's like, okay, you can only have the corporate lockdown laptop with the three applications, and you can only go out to certain websites. Unless you're the NSA or, or some sort of government organization or some top secret laboratory out there, odds are that ain't going to fly. So how do we get past that and enable people, right? This is the enterprise 
problem. How do we enable people to continue to work, be happy, be productive, while maintaining a good level of risk? This requires a lot more than just your traditional security, network security and software security kind of stuff. It requires the entire thing working together. So you're kind of talking a little bit more about like reputation management in terms of the devices. I mean, you, you talk about it as being assets because they are, yeah. but I mean, it's it's really about reputation. Once the device comes on the network, how how is that device repeatedly used over time? Is it used sure. in ways that that maintain the integrity of the security, or is it somebody who's potentially doing something you wouldn't want them to do? Well, a new, say a new tablet walks into the network, acquires an IP address. You can do a quick look up on against the asset table and say, okay, do I know this pro device profile? Like, have I seen this before? If the answer is, yes, I have, or it looks familiar, then you go, okay, that's fantastic. Let's keep an eye on it. Next step is, let's see what it does, what it accesses, what data it's going after, what systems are being connected to. If you plug something in, the first thing it does is start scanning the network or starts accessing uh, you know, your ERP server, you're straight to your ERP database, not, with, not through the front end. You're like, eh, okay. So you're either malicious, and you're trying to sneak one by us, or you're doing something that I don't know about yet, which I probably should know about, some new process got instituted. Um, so what you can do is basically, you know, we've got the technology to quarantine at this point, right? Basically say, okay, no more IP for you until I know what you're doing. I'm gonna take every everything you try to go access, I'm gonna give you this web page that says, I'd like you to identify, like I really wanna know who you are. No, no, you, you can't go there. I really, really wanna know who you are. And if you don't wanna tell me, fine, I'm turning your access off, right? And this is kind of like what NAC tried to do, but eh, varying degrees of success out there. It's this real-time access. It's not, but it's not just devices. It's applications. It's services. It's access to cloud systems. It's access to it's new users that show up. Right. All of a sudden, uh, John's account is uh, accessing uh, the financial network um, at three o'clock in the afternoon. That's great. But John's on vacation. Right. Okay. Well, your HR system knows that. But your security system probably doesn't have a concept of on vacation. This is why these things need to be linked together. We've got, and we've got the correlation technology. We've got the idea to cross-link all these systems. We've got the capabilities. We're just not doing it as, a, as an enterprise out there, and we should. So what is it going to take to move people to, to doing these kinds of things? Is it going to take a, a major uh, uh, fallout, kind of like the way, the way people start getting serious about uh, data loss prevention um, about the time that the first time they lose a lot of data? Well, you know, people, and unfortunately, organizations tend to find religion in security once they've had a tremendously bad incident happen or somebody comes into their organization that's had this kind of history of, of, of failing that way. The truth is, you know, every organization's different. Uh, there's proactive organizations. It's like that bell curve, right? E mostly everybody is in that, yeah, we'll get to it when it becomes important to me. Uh, or becomes a requ compliance requirement someplace. It, it, the people that, you, you get security people that say, you know, my CIO doesn't care about security. They may not care about security in that word, but they care about, you know, the fact that their systems are available, their customers trust them, they can place orders from the internet at any given t point in time, and if your database got hacked, you can't do that, therefore you care about security, right? So it's, it's really, I mean, we gotta get better as an industry, as a security profession, we got to get better at talking to the enterprise and making them understand what it is that we do, why it's important, why it's relevant. Because running around saying you're going to get hacked, you're going to get hacked if you don't do this, look, it hasn't worked in 15 years effectively to get everybody's attention. And we're still those whack jobs running around, you know, kind of being scaring people. It's not scared tactics don't work. They shouldn't work, right? You know, it's kind of like everybody's afraid of sharks. And, you know, you go in the water, you don't want to get eaten by a shark. But did you know that more people get uh, injured by vending machines than sharks every year. Irrational fears. I, I did not know that. You do now. I, I, now I'm afraid of vending machines. Right, but everybody uses vending machines every single day, yet they kill more people than sharks do. But it's like, what are we afraid of? Well, we're afraid of sharks, because they're, you know, they're the unknown, they're the big bad thing. It's like, are we, we, are we afraid of security? Are we afraid of those hackers? Well, you know, we could be, and rightfully we should be aware of what they could do to us. But if we're prepared and, and if we're properly aware of how to detect them, respond to them, and restore our services, then, you know, we can just say simply, all right, at some point, we're going to get chomped on. We may lose a finger, but we need to have, you know, figure out how to get that finger, get back, get it back on, and get back to doing what we were doing. All right, well, I'm going to try to keep my fingers. As always, it's a lot of fun. Hey, watch out for those vending machines, folks.